My name is Anna Grzyma Abusa. I am the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. Um, and it is my distinct pleasure today to introduce Stathis Kalibas, the Arnold Wolfers Professor of Political Science um, and the director of the program on Order, Conflict, and Violence at Yale University. He's the author of numerous award-winning publications, most notably two books, um, The Rise of the Christian Democracy in Europe and The Logic of Violence and Civil War, which became instant classics and garnered numerous awards. Um, Professor Kalibas is also an active participant and organizer in the Olympia Summer School Program, which brings together scholars in intensive training sessions in Greece, as well as a highly published um, public intellectual both in Greece and more broadly in Europe. His latest book, Modern Greece, published last year, examines the often torturous path of Greek political and economic development. And so we can't think of a better person to explain to us <laughs> Greece and the Eurozone where to than Satis. Welcome. Well, thanks a lot. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, it's always a great opportunity to talk about uh, this uh, never-ending story. <laughs> I was supposed to come back to come here initially um, last November, and then I got a very bad flu, and so I had to update uh, this uh, uh, talk, and I, I've been wondering every time that I'm d updating exactly, you know, what direction are things going to go. There's not an answer, so I've tried to pack as much information as I could, uh, it's going to be very dense. At the same time, I hope to be able to uh, at least um, explain the basic uh, patterns of that story. It's a story that has obsessed me, uh, like a lot of people, mostly because I'm Greek, but also because it uh, is a fascinating story. It interacts with a lot of um, different aspects of European politics. My focus is going to be mostly on Greece, and then the last slide is about European implications, but then I'm open to discuss any aspect and any dimension uh, you'd like. So I'm going to start uh, very quickly with uh, some uh, uh, background about the uh, crisis in Greece and Europe. And then I've organized the information in 10 questions and answers, trying to uh, pack as much information, but at the same time in a way that's um, easy to uh, navigate. Uh, and as I said, at the end, I'm going to discuss a few of these implications. So why uh, being interested in Greece? Uh, of course, being Greek is one uh, uh, big factor, but I would argue that uh, Greece is a very relevant outlier. It's not what is going on in Greece is not necessarily representative of what is going on in other Eurozone countries, but at the same time is extremely relevant for what is going on and give us uh, it gives us the opportunity to ask a set of questions about the future of European integration in general. Um, there are two particular aspects that are very interesting. One is in terms of uh, theoretical implications, uh, the political implications of um, very uh, intense recession, how are politics affected by these kinds of processes, especially given the uh, interface between in a sense, globalized politics and domestic politics, and on the other hand, the larger implications, as I said, for the European project. So the basic timeline of the crisis is very pretty well understood. The source of the problem initially was, or the trigger of the crisis, was the 2008 subprime crisis. In 2009, a new government uh, led by the socialists that came in power announced uh, a recounting of the uh, deficit, uh, and uh, it turned out that the size of the deficit was much larger uh, than anticipated and uh, permitted. The, Euro the Eurozone had the rule that you couldn't exceed 3% of your GDP. Greece was expected to have something like 5%. It ended up being 13%, so it was giant. And that created a panic in the markets that triggered uh, the crisis. As a result, Greece was unable to borrow on the um, financial markets to, uh, in a sense, refinance its uh, very large debt. And as a result, uh, it accepted a bailout uh, which was given to it from the primarily from the European Union, but also the, the Eurozone countries, that is, but also the European Central Bank and the IMF. Uh, the initial uh, bailout package was 110 uh, billion. There have been two more um, and they are now in excess of about 450 billion. So it's an enormous uh, amount uh, that breaks a lot of world records. Uh, in 2011, the crisis deepened, both politically and economically as well. There was also uh, a restructuring of the debt, a haircut, which was quite significant, and a second bailout. 2012, we had a uh, double election, the first elections after the crisis that didn't produce any clear outcome, and then another one. Uh, then things seemed to calm down in July 2012 when the new uh, president of the um, 
European Central Bank announced a new policy of uh, sub buying uh, bonds of, of European countries that led off some of the pressure that the markets were putting on, uh, especially the countries of the European South. There was a period of political and economic stabilization that came to an end uh, a year ago with the election in Greece, uh, much anticipated and much followed um, election in power of a radical uh, leftist party, uh, which uh, led to a very interesting uh, year uh, in which uh, uh, a referendum to play took place in Greece in July, leading eventually to um, uh, a third bailout. And we are here in 2016. In, in a sense, we're back in 2011. And so it's unclear how things are going to work out. So I'm going to try to uh, decompose uh, a lot of what happened in terms of uh, 10 basic issues. But let me give you first, I think, a, a nice um, description of what happened. And Un unfortunately, that stops immediately after the summer of 15. I haven't um, uh, updated uh, that graph. So you have First of all, in October 2009, the election of the uh, Socialist Party in Greece. Uh, and this, is the, the, this graph um, uh, is the, uh, what we call the spread, the distance between um, uh, the cost uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the borrowing by, uh, by the Greek state on financial markets versus the cost that Germany uh, uh, undertakes to borrow money on the same markets. So the biggest the distance uh, between the Greek cost of borrowing and the German cost of borrowing, the so-called spread, the biggest the crisis and the biggest the inability to finance the Greek debt. The second, gra this, the orange line is the line that describes the level uh, of deposits in Greek banks. Uh, so. 2009, we have uh, the election of the Socialist Party, and you can see for the first time uh, there is an announcement, a decision by various um, uh, rating agencies uh, describing a lot of the, uh, the Greek bonds as junk. The cost of borrowing goes up, the spread goes up. So the first bailout is at this point. Uh, we have a political crisis with a, government, a coalition government by technocrats that precedes the haircut and precedes a very high rise in risk, uh, in a sense. The second bailout takes place uh, uh, in the uh, spring of 2011. Uh, and then we have the double elections of 2012, the election of a new government, a grand coalition of the two leading Greek parties. And then we have the election uh, of the radical left uh, in January 2015. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the highest point of the risk was in 2012, but also the risk went quite high in terms of borrowing, even though that doesn't mean much because Greece was not borrowing anymore uh, here. But uh, the, other, uh, the other dimension is the, the level of deposits in Greek banks, which actually were doing quite well up to um, 2010. They were collecting a lot of money. Greek banks were considered safe at the time because they didn't have toxic assets they hadn't bought, they were not risky, but they had a lot of Greek bonds in their papers, and that proved to be their undoing. And you can see that uh, as the risk goes up, deposits go down. And this is the period of stabilization, the plateau between 2012 and 2014, when things look like they stabilize, and then after the election of the radical left, we have a complete collapse of deposits, which led to capital controls during the summer. So effectively, the banks are not really operating uh, anymore as banks. So the 10 questions I'm going to ask are the following ones. First of all, what kind of crisis are we talking about? The second question is, what are, were the causes of that crisis? The third uh, is, what kind of bailout uh, and what kind of solution was given to that crisis? Fourth question, what was the political and economic impact of that bailout and set of bailouts in general? What kind of debt does Greece have? There is a lot of discussion about debt sustainability. What kind of politics followed in the wake of these kinds of economic developments? And especially what kind of radical left was the radical left party that won power uh, in the general elections? What kind of negotiations took place during the last year? The referendum that took place during the summer and where uh, uh, is the direction of things going? Um, I'm going to give you my take uh, on these questions, uh, recognizing the fact that there are different interpretations and, of course, endless debates on each. Uh, 
there's nothing you know more uh, humbling than trying to understand and interpret current events for a social scientist. We, generally speaking, when we do social science, we simplify everything. We look at the big picture. When you try to provide an account of events that took place in the last six years, it's much more difficult, it turns out. So respect for the pundits. So what kind <laughs> of crisis? Uh, it turns out there were several uh, simultaneous and uh, successive crises that took place. And one of the things that makes this, um, following this type of process so fascinating is the extent to which these things have a capacity to transform themselves as they are going. So th things are never exactly as they were at the beginning. There is a process. One of the things that um, uh, social scientists are very concerned is the problem of endogeneity, of reverse causation or complex causation. What, one thing that you find when you look at this process is how everything is incredibly endogenous from the very first moment, and it's very difficult to disentangle those processes. Well, it started as a sovereign debt crisis. That is, the Greek sovereign could no longer borrow on the markets to refinance uh, its debt. But it turns out that it was also a deficit crisis uh, and an external balance crisis. Why? Because the Greek debt was owned uh, to a very large extent to foreign borrowers. It was not a domestic debt. And in fact, there's a very interesting paper that came out uh, a couple of months ago by um, Reinhardt and Trebesh, two economists who look at the pattern of uh, Greek debt over time. It turns out Greece is um, almost exceptional um, in that it had relied very much throughout its, its history on external uh, debt as opposed to domestic debt. So it's a very different case from, from Japan, for example. Making things more complicated, Greece didn't have its own currency. So it, couldn't, it didn't have the domestic uh, financial means to face these kinds of crises. Uh, so very unusual case, and that's why there was a lot of interest of it, because it was a unique combination uh, uh, of um, dimensions. On top of it, it was also an external balance crisis. And I think that's, at the end of the day, one of the most important and difficult issues, uh, meaning that Greece uh, was unable, in a sense, to balance its exports and imports, uh, which very often uh, is a problem that is addressed with the tools of currency devaluation, which were not available to the Greek state. On top of it, that generated the legitimacy crisis for the Greek political system, leading to the destruction of the dominant party in Greece, the Socialist Party, and a very big shock for the next, uh, the other party. The two parties, as we're going to see, used to get about 75 to 80 percent of the votes combined, and that was completely uh, almost um, vaporized. A and uh, to make things even more complicated, a state capacity crisis. The state itself didn't have the capacity to actually um, police the country and deliver a set of very basic public goods. So it was a perfect storm uh, in many ways. On top of it, uh, that crisis very soon became a crisis of the European South. So a number of other countries faced the si similar problem, all albeit to a lesser degree. So countries like Ireland, uh, Portugal, um, Cyprus um, had to seek um, European support. Spain came very close to it. And there was a lot of concern about Italy and also eventually France. Uh, and that led to um, descriptions of the crisis as fundamentally a European imbalance crisis. Uh, the basic uh, insight here is that the Eurozone is very heterogeneous. It includes countries with very different um, economic profiles, which means that when some countries are doing well uh, in the north, producing excess cash and liquidity, that cash is seeking outlets uh, in the countries that are doing less well. Uh, as a result, those countries borrow very heavily, and that creates this logic of imbalance, which then percolates back into politics. Um, and of course, it was a European banking crisis because a lot of this debt was owned, uh, owed by European banks, meaning that uh, a default by Greece or other southern European countries would completely destroy or had the potential of severely harming the European banking sector. And therefore, the potential for contagion was at the time very high. It was a problem uh, of the euro currency, what it meant and how it operated. Uh, the argument was here that uh, the euro currency was um, an incomplete currency, uh, that you had countries sharing uh, the same uh, currency but not sharing uh, 
uh, the economic and fiscal institutions that are necessary to back this currency. Uh, and it was therefore also a crisis of political integration and the European project in general. So it combined all of those different aspects. One of the things that makes uh, discussing uh, this crisis very confusing is very often people uh, talk past each other because they are focusing on different aspects of this crisis. For example, people like Paul Krugman emphasized very much the question of austerity. People uh, who are very interested in the financial or banking sector emphasized very other, different other dimensions. People who focus very much on the European project emphasized institutional dimensions. And very often they were um, having debates in which they were emphasizing different dimensions without realizing that that was the case. And that added to the acrimony and confusion. What were the causes uh, of that crisis, both at the Eurozone and uh, in Greece in general? I've mentioned some of those. There were global causes, uh, and that was the, the big uh, the effect of the American crisis. There were European causes, and that mostly was a set uh, of issues um, around the design of the institutions surrounding uh, the euro currency. And of course, there were Greek causes. And again, that created a lot of confusion because very often people would emphasize different dimensions. In Greece, for example, there was a very interesting debate between people who pointed to the Greek pathologies and problems and people who would respond by pointing out uh, the European uh, pathologies uh, and, and problems. And that didn't help. And on top of it, the connections between those different levels were quite complex, and there were feedback loops. Uh, as soon as one level was doing badly, it affected how the other levels operated. How, however, um, in spite of the common features that characterize the crisis in different countries of the European South, there were also very specific features that characterize Greece. And we are going to see it's impossible to understand the evolution of the process last year without understanding the features that were unique to Greece uh, that help us make sense of how things developed. Because of this complexity, uh, what is very interesting in this case is how the politics of framing were a key aspect of the uh, process itself. So it was not about what was going on. It was also about how various political actors were framing the process which is also very interesting, and how their success or failure in framing in certain ways was, in a sense, uh, feedbacking back into uh, the process itself. What kind of bailout? Uh, so initially, there was no European Eurozone provisions about facing a situation like that. There were no institutions devoted to this question. There were not tools of it. European Eurozone countries were supposed, for example, not to exceed 3% deficit. Various countries had exceeded that level in the past, including both Germany and France. Um, but no country had exceeded it to the degree that turned out Greece had exceeded it. And, th and that created a very big issue uh, and a very big backlash. Uh, the range of solutions at the time ranged from uh, a full bailout without any conditions at one extreme, which is an impossibility, of course. Nobody bails you out without conditions to uh, a default uh, in the other extreme, uh, meaning uh, that Greece would uh, either negotiate or impose a restructuring of its debt or just stop paying and become a pariah state. Uh, once you stop paying, when you st once you default on your, on your creditors, it's very difficult to re-enter financial markets. Argentina, for example, that did the same in 2001, it's still excluded from financial markets, and that creates very long-term uh, problems as well. Uh, in any case, one of the things that were missed was that in the case of Greece specifically, what we call f fiscal front loading uh, or rebalancing uh, uh, of the fiscal balance and what is understood popularly as austerity was unavoidable, one way or another. If Greece defaulted, for example, given its 15% deficit, it would have, in a sense, to balance its book, its books immediately, which would, would, would be equivalent of a humanitarian disaster because it wouldn't be able to finance basic operations of the state, including healthcare, for example. So austerity was not really in the balance one way or another. However, what was on the balance was the question of debt restructuring. And there is a consensus uh, that, um, and I'm going to mention that in a moment, that. Uh, it was a mistake that there wasn't um, 
a debt restructuring from the get-go, from the outset, to give a better shot to any restructuring, to any um, bailout plan that Greece would have adopted. And the reason there was no uh, restructuring at the time was because there was a fear that that could cause, that that would have severe implications for the whole uh, uh, financial architecture of, of Europe. Um, there was a no bailout clause, so the Eurozone had explicitly prohibited any bailout of countries uh, exceeding their capacity uh, to borrow and therefore unable to pay. Why? Because in the absence uh, of a common fiscal set of institutions, the only way uh, for countries not to, in a sense, free ride on a common currency was to threaten punishment uh, in case, uh, uh, you know, those countries were not able to abide by, by the terms they agreed. So in a sense, even though there were the, the, ev the eventuality of having to go through a bailout because of the, um, of the particular conditions of the European currency made it, in a sense, necessary for a stick to follow uh, the carrot of the bailout. And this is why the IMF came into the picture, complicating things even more, because the IMF is an institution with a very different profile uh, that was the first and the biggest, um, not the first, but the biggest um, and one of the um, unusual interventions of, on the IMF in a developed country, in a developed economy. Usually the IMF focuses very much on Latin American, Asian economies, developing economies. The reason why it got involved from the European perspective was to bring in an institution that both had the capacity to implement and monitor such a program, but also uh, could carry a big stick. Uh, and to make an example so that the problem wouldn't be repeated. There was also a very interesting side story. At the, at the time, the IMF was led by a French banker and politician, Dominique Stoscan, who had a very bad end, <laughs> whose ambition was to run for French president and who thought that by involving the IMF into the European rescue project, you know, would, do, would, do, uh, would garnish, garnish his reputation in the European context. So the program came with a very strong conditionality. As I said, there was a decision not to restructure, but then when things became clear that uh, the debt was not sustainable in 2012, there was a restructuring, uh, which was quite significant, but perhaps came too late. Uh, and there were very optimistic pro projections. Uh, the initial bailout plan was projecting a return of Greece to growth by 2012, which never happened. And in fact, it's very interesting to compare the projections at various points with the actual realizations. Exactly why that happened uh, is a very interesting topic in and of itself. Uh, the chief economist of the IMF at the time, Olivier Blanchard, wrote a very interesting paper explaining the problem of multipliers, basically explaining why uh, there was um, the models that were used to project the effect of the uh, bailout in Greece underestimated the cost and, and the damage that was going to be done. Uh, which also uh, points to a poor understanding of the way in which the Greek economy was operating. And finally, there was at some point the uh, question of uh, Greek exit, Greece exiting the, the Eurozone, uh, which became known as Grexit, and which became a sort of independent variable in the whole process, because every time Grexit came back, it made everything worse. Uh, and it, it caused uh, any additional correction to be much more expensive and complicated uh, than before. The reason why Grexit was such a, a very important factor was because uh, the, Euro the Eurozone and every currency is based on an understanding that those participating in, in it cannot leave, because that would question um, the, uh, the basic uh, cohesion uh, and um, reputation of the currency itself. A very important point that I wish to make here, and I can return to that, is that very often discussions about Grexit, the benefits versus the cost of it, very made a very, big, uh, a very big mistake in their assumption. They assumed that leaving the euro was equivalent to joining the euro. But those two decisions are very different decisions. And I think the best metaphor to understand the difference between the two is to, for example, give you the example of deciding to board an airplane versus deciding to exit an airplane while it is flying, right? It's not the same. So joining the euro, you can make the argument that Greece shouldn't have been admitted in the first place. That's one question. But once admitted, leaving is a very different uh, proposition. Very often people confuse the two.
And it is the case that in the case of Greece, and this is an aspect that I want to emphasize because it, is often get, it often gets lost uh, in the debates, uh, the euro had a very positive side on the Greek economy. Just to give you an example, uh, this is the rate of inflation. Uh, between 1955 and 1970, the Greek currency, the drachma, was pegged to the dollar. And you can see that inflation was very low. And then that peg was removed, tremendous inflation, and this is when Greece actually starts implementing measures to enter the euro, and you can see that inflation goes back. Uh, it disappears completely. So uh, the euro uh, membership for Greece had two very big positive effects. The first is it eliminated instability it eliminated all the problems that developing economies have with weak currencies. Uh, and the second thing is it made borrowing very cheap, which was the undoing uh, of the Greek uh, political system in Greece. Uh, the second thing that I want to uh, highlight is in spite of the crisis and the tremendous impact it, it has had on Greece, which I'm going to discuss and show you very, very soon, Greece never lost as much as it has won as it had won since joining and if you calculate if you add to that the positive effects of the period before joining that were in anticipation of joining uh, i would argue that even today uh, the balance of the euro membership for greece has been on, on, on overall positive that is greece is better off than when it joined and it remains in the top 35 to 40 countries in terms of GDP per capita and basic indicators of human development. So in spite of all its problems, it is still a rather wealthy country, comparatively speaking. So what has been the impact of the crisis? Pretty enormous. When you see, for example, these kinds of comparisons, and these uh, do not take into account the last year, which was not a good year, you see that, uh, with the exception of Latvia and the United States Great Depression, the loss uh, of uh, GDP has been enormous for Greece. So very big loss. And you can see the same uh, when you look at these uh, charts uh, and these graphs. You can see here uh, the United States Great Depression. And you can see Greece, in fact, it is kind of staying stable instead of recovering. Uh, and this is the loss of GDP between 2008 and 2014. Uh, and, and you can see 2014 was a positive year for GDP, but the amount of loss has been enormous. Now, of course, very often in terms of relative loss, the loss has been similar to the U.S. Great Depression. In terms of absolute value, however, it's not the same because Greece was a much wealthier country than the U.S. were uh, during that time. The, when we compare Greece to other uh, countries under crisis, we can see that the rebalancing is unique, is a unique mix to every country. So we can see here how policy responses vary, are not the same. And basically Greece chose a mix in which it combined uh, cuts in spending with cuts in taxes. But the, uh, the very interesting comparison is Ireland. Ireland didn't collect, didn't try to collect more money, it just slashed spending without raising taxes. And uh, by the way, Ireland is the country that has performed the best among the countries uh, in crisis. Um, if you look, uh, however, also at the uh, amount of reforms that were implemented, uh, Greece performs very well in terms of the score that it, it has gotten. And this also opens up a very interesting question about the measurement of reforms. Uh, political scientists very often measure reforms in terms of what has been uh, voted, but we don't really look down the, uh, to figure out exactly how are things implemented. Uh, especially, it turns out, it's very difficult to successfully implement reforms that have been voted in times of extreme crisis. And as a result, uh, one gets a sense that no matter how many reforms you implement, you actually you aren't on a treadmill. You don't really gain much. So the summary of impact is a great depression, but as I said, Greece remains still better off. It's also not clear what the counterfactual is, both the counterfactual of Greece not joining the euro, but also the counterfactual of Greece defaulting. And very often, a, a lot of these debates are based on assumptions about the counterfactuals, which are at least never specified and tend to be, uh, in a sense, constructed in a way to make certain arguments look better than others. Uh, the, the countries that went through this process, the so-called pigs uh, of, of uh, being bailed out uh, under deals with extreme conditionality of the same sort, 
uh, has, have, has been very divergent. Greece remains the only country uh, under uh, in agreement right now. The other countries have all exited uh, the memorandum uh, and uh, have their own uh, independent sovereign economic policy right now. So one needs to explain the terrible performance of Greece, not just in general, but also compared to the other countries that underwent the same crisis. Very often, people provide an explanation for why things went badly by mentioning austerity. But this is a bit of a tautology, both in the sense that austerity, that is slashing spending, increasing taxes, that is trying to generate more revenue, is by definition something that is going to hurt. But also because it turns out there are some other aspects as well which caused Greece to underperform that have not been discussed so much. These have to do with very large uh, and very often uh, widely unknown um, kind of well-hidden distortions of the economy, but also the effects of political instability, and finally uh, the extent to which the fear of Grexit in and of itself was causing additional uh, political and economic effects that in, in a sense uh, were making the crisis much larger. So uh, there was quite a lot going on at the same time. What kind of debt? There, is a lot of, there was a lot of discussion last year, and I, I would argue that one of the proponents of this uh, position in the United States was Paul Krugman, uh, that the, the core of the Greek problem was the problem of debt. Obviously, when you have a very large debt uh, and you undergo uh, a cure of austerity, you, in a sense, either uh, fail to slash this debt or increase it, because your GDP uh, goes down, and the debt is usually calculated in terms of percentage over the GDP. However, um, and, and there has been a lot of discussion about the sustainability of the Greek debt. In fact, the IMF had to change its own rules about the level uh, in which a, a debt is sustainable. There are very interesting debates among economists. And when you read these kinds of things, you realize how economics sometimes becomes very close to metaphysics. But questions about what is a sustainable debt or not are not really easily resolvable on purely empirical grounds. But a lot of people agree that and made the point that the Greek debt is so big that it's not really sustainable, meaning it's never going to be repaid, and that has a number of consequences down the road. However, I would argue that uh, at least to some extent, part of this discussion was a red herring, that it was not all about the debt. And the reason for that is because um, even without an explicit restructuring, uh, there has been and there is going to be in the future even more an implicit restructuring of the Greek debt, meaning that uh, if you think of debt not necessarily as stock but as flow, things like um, uh, the, uh, the level of uh, interest rates you have to pay, the maturity of your debt matter very much. Uh, and I'm going to give you some, some elements about that, but it turns out the features of the Greek debt, not as a stock, but as a flow, um, are very, uh, I would say, positive when you think about sustainability. Uh, what is also very interesting is the uh, changes uh, in the way, in the ownership of that debt, uh, which in the first and second bailout was primarily carried out to a small extent by the IMF and the ECB, the European Central Bank, and to a large extent by the member states of the Eurozone. And what happened is a complete switch, especially after um, the haircut of 2012. Uh, private lenders, uh, in a sense, vanished from the picture. So the Greek debt is not only externally owned, but it's also unique in that it is owned by the so-called official sector, by other states. And those states happen to be Greece's main allies, which makes the question of an outright default a very different kind of question, because it becomes a purely political problem. Uh, on top of it, uh, in the third bailout, most of the, of the Greek debt that is owned as part of the third bailout is owned by a European, a new European institution, the EFSF, which is a stability fund, which in fact is in fact suggesting a process of mutualization from the back door of uh, the European debt, which means that eventually that debt, which is not going to be repaid in terms of uh, cash, uh, is going to be carried out by European institutions. Um, as I said, uh, one of the things that's uh, uh, very interesting to observe is that despite all this infusion of money, the Greek debt 
is increasing or remaining stable instead of decreasing. I'm going to skip that. Um, and this is the, the uh, element that I mentioned before. Who are the creditors? In terms both of the composition of the Greek debt, but also of the schedule of repayments, uh, it's primarily, uh, as you can see in the future, the European Financial Stability Fund, the EFSF. Uh, the, the yellow uh, corresponds to the Eurozone governments. And only in the first phase, up to 2020, you have payments that are uh, due to uh, the IMF and the European Central Bank. Uh, and other treasury holders. After that, Greece becomes basically indebted to its allies and Europe. In a sense, it becomes a province, so to speak, of Europe. So uh, here we have a very interesting aspect of that question. That is, at the same time that we're discussing a country leaving the common currency, we're also observing how this country becomes much more tethered to that entity than even before. So we have the two opposites existing at the same time and being possibilities simultaneously. So quantum finance here, <laughs> two opposite things at the same time. What kind of politics do we have? Well, as I said, uh, to a great extent, the Greek politics diverged from the politics of the other countries that underwent this, you know, s the same treatment. That is, Greece was the only country in which basically the party system that existed for a very large number of years completely collapsed. And a completely marginal party uh, managed to uh, win power. Spain, which is probably the case that comes the closest with two new parties, Podemos and Ciudadanos, still hasn't reached the point in which the old system has become completely discredited. So Greece is quite exceptional in that respect. And I think that to understand um, that you can emphasize, uh, of course, the depth and the intensity of the Greek crisis, but also you have to take into account elements about the function and the form of Greek politics, especially the extent to which those politics were based on a social contract uh, that was very clientelistic in the sense of the existence of a quid pro quo that was much more understood in terms of individual so to speak, contracts, people voting for certain parties in exchange for very specific um, goods, very much like the Chicago party machine during the 1930s operated. And that allows you, I think, to understand why people uh, became very upset when this social contract collapsed. It was not just a matter of general promises, but also a matter of specific uh, goods that were given. That illustrates uh, the evolution of the Greek party system. We have the socialist parties in green, uh, its performance, and the conservative uh, party, New Democracy, in blue, and the combined score of the two parties. And you can see how both of them eventually, uh, at the end, collapsed, with the socialist party being, I think, beyond salvation, but uh, the right-wing party uh, managing to survive. And that gives you uh, the evolution uh, of uh, the scores of those parties. The May 2012 elections are what we call realignment elections. And once politics realign, they don't return back. Uh, so you can see how the Socialist Party went from 43rd, 44% to 13% in just a matter of three years. Um, there are various explanations for that. And I'm happy to discuss why the Socialist Party paid such a big cost. Uh, one obvious factor is that the crisis exploded into their hands, even though they were not uh, those who created it, at least not immediately. But also the right-wing party uh, was affected. This was a sort of far-right party which was also affected. And here you can see how this small radical party of the left went from 4% in that election to 16%, which is an enormous change. And also the fact is that it became the second strongest party. So it was able to become the focal point for a lot of people who were disenchanted with the previous situation, especially from, for former voters of the Socialist Party. Um, and then we had a small splinter party from New Democracy, a far-right party, which did very well in those elections. And what is very interesting is that this far-right party became the main um, uh, coalition partner of the left party, which is a basic, um, I would argue, um, uh, exception from a very basic rule of political science of the minimum winning coalitions and of parties in coalition being very close <coughs> ideologically. So those parties could not be f further away from each other. 
On top of it, there was a neo-Nazi party that appeared, making things even more complicated. Uh, and here you can see how in June 2012, the right-wing party uh, recovered. Uh, uh, there was a time in which a lot of people speculated that Greece was going to exit, uh, whereas the Socialist Party could not. And that is the evolution of that score in the last elections of January 2015 and those in the elections of September 2015, uh, um, about which I'm going to talk. So you can see how the radical left party was polling 36 and 35 percent uh, and establishing itself as the leading party in Greece. So a lot of people ask the question, what kind of party? What kind of radical left? And a lot of people, in a sense, projected in that party every desire they had that included from a sort of socialist revolutions in, uh, revolution in Europe to anything else. So people, it was a blank slate. Nobody knew what to expect. That was the situation a year ago. Uh, so a lot of people argued that Syriza was really uh, the beacon of hope. Uh, a lot of people invested a lot of their hopes in that party. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but the question is, why did this party manage to, uh, in a sense, uh, collect a lot of these um, uh, a lot of this dis dis disenchantment. And I would argue here again that it was very interesting to observe this uh, conversation knowing something about the Greek context because one could see how uh, the international debate very often was lacking uh, a lot of crucial elements about the domestic situation. And that domestic situation is that, in a sense, that party was not so much articulating just a leftist radical uh, vocabulary, but was, in a sense, had captured and repurposed the basic um, and fundamental aspects of the ideology of the Socialist Party before that, uh, in a sense, the populist ideology, which explains why, when the moment came to choose a partner, they didn't choose other leftist parties or center-left parties, but they chose a far-right party, because they shared this combination uh, of populism and nationalism that was the essential component of what made the Socialist Party very successful. And so I would argue that a very nice uh, analogy for understanding Syriza is the Peronist Party in Argentina and how, in fact, the Peronist Party could cover a lot of space from you know, the most neoliberal kind of set of policies under Menem to uh, a set of populist policies, socialist in certain fields and certainly in discourse, but not necessarily socialist in economics. When the, social, the, the, the radical left party won, it won in a, uh, under a political platform to completely renegotiate the bailout deal, to change economic policy, to change not only the way Greece was run, but also in its very ambition to affect the way in which Greece, uh, in, in which Europe was run. So it was a very maximalist kind of discourse. Uh, and that led to a very interesting uh, year uh, in which everyone was following with a lot of interest what was going on, and that, I think, summarizes, um, in a sense, the, the logic of that negotiation. But the economists had four cartoons, which I think tell a lot of, of that story. <laughs> uh, that was the, you know, the expectation uh, among uh, some quarters. So all of those emphasized very much the idea uh, that Greece by, in a sense, owing so much debt to the rest of Europe, had the capacity to threaten uh, a very big damage by defaulting. And as a result, would be able to get a better deal on the basis of that threat. And a lot of people describe that as a chicken game. And the fact that the Minister of Finance was uh, an economist specializing in game theory made that even more uh, attractive <laughs> for journalists. Um, but at the end of the day, the chicken game didn't pay for Greece. Uh, when the two sides came to collision, uh, it turns out that it was the Greek side that chickened rather than the European side. So the question is why? Why Greece had no chance? Well, it had no chance because unlike 2010, right, its debt profile, that is the spreads, the expectation by the markets of its potential of repayment and therefore risk, uh, diverged completely from that of the other countries under crisis. So Greece was perceived by the markets as an exceptional case, as a divergent case, not as a case representing the rest uh, of the other countries. Now, that was known from the very beginning. So anyone who knew something about you know, very basic things should have anticipated the outcome. 
And it's very interesting to ask the question, why did the Greek government kept doubling down given that reality that was very well known from the beginning? Um, and that's a very interesting question, and we can talk about you know, what went on, and we still do not have all the missing pieces. So the process of negotiations went on uh, for a very long time. Um, there were a lot of rebounds, a lot of cliff cliffhangers. Uh, people expected in February there was an agreement. People thought that would be basically the beginning of the end. It turned out not to be. And things went uh, uh, to, um, in a sense, a sort of close to end game at the very critical point, which was when Greece had exhausted all its resources and was going to have to default on a payment, uh, uh, on its payment to the ECB. In fact, it defaulted on a payment to the IMF, the first developed country that ever did that. Um, and it was clear that that was the point in which, if Greece defaulted on its allies, it would have to, to leave the Eurozone which also was a, a sort of legal minefield because it was not clear how exactly you left the common currency and what it meant for your membership to the European Union. So it was extremely complicated. Uh, when things came to the end game, instead of a compromise, that is of the Greek government backing down, the Greek government did the ultimate doubling down. It called for a referendum, which was the strangest referendum of all. Uh, because if you look at the question, that was being asked to Greek voters in terms of how it was printed on the ballots. It called the Greek voters to decide on two very complicated financial agreement texts written in English. <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> the most interesting point. Of course, people don't vote on what they see in front of them. They vote uh, on what um, their leaders and the leaders they trust tell them uh, those ballots uh, point out. So why call a referendum? There are many theories about that, but probably ex uh, post, it is, I think, logical to argue that it was a case of um, the leader of the Greek and, and that party facing uh, the uh, possibility of compromising and of losing face decided to play their last card, hoping that perhaps by doubling down one more time they would, they would cause um, they, they would get a better deal. Uh, and it turns out they had two expectations when they did that. The first one was that they still thought, which is very strange given the fundamentals, they still thought that the markets would react in a way that would, f that would force the hand of the Eurozone countries. Uh, and that's why the referendum was announced uh, after midnight on a Friday, after all the markets had closed, with the expectation that on Monday morning there would be a very big shock, and that would completely base the negotiations on a different standing. The second explanation, which is not mutually exclusive with the first, is it was a very big effort to get Russia to lend Greece and to allow it, in a sense, to keep uh, pay its obligations. And apparently there was a telephone conversation on Monday morning between Tsipras and Putin in which Putin decided and didn't have actually given the situation in Russia and general considerations didn't come through. So that is another argument that I've heard, that there was a sort of geopolitical gamemanship. Um, in the question that was asked was for the Greek public to approve the supposed deal that was on the table in the negotiations up to that point or to reject it, where the deal would have been for Greece, in a sense, to continue in the same program. So basically, uh, the Greek public was asked to vote in favor of a very painful austerity or to reject it. And on top of it, the leader of the Syriza party, Alexis Tsipras, the prime minister, made the case that the rejection would be costless. And in fact, it would be advantageous to Greece because it would allow Greece to negotiate from a stronger position. So as a result of, of that framing uh, and the fact that the majority uh, bought that framing, uh, a 60%, 61% of the electorate rejected the deal. And then eventually, I immediately after that, the Greek government backed down, uh, making, in a sense, a complete sham of the whole process. Um, why did Tsipras decide to, decide to make this U-turn? Because the alternative would have meant the collapse of the country and his own uh, destruction. I mean, it, 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 it would, it, uh, when the, the referendum was announced, the European Central Bank stopped providing emergency assistance to the Greek banks because it meant that Greece moved out of the program. Uh, 
which meant that capital controls had to be introduced to avert, to stop uh, the uh, deposit flight that was taking place, which created very big concerns about uh, even the, provision, the, uh, the provisioning of the, the Greek economy, which is dependent on imports. So it created a very, uh, and I can talk more about that, a very uh, dire kind of situation. Uh, but what is very interesting is that um, in the context of the referendum, uh, the, uh, it, an opportunity was given to the Greek electorate to vent its discontent and to vent its defiance uh, without at the same time understanding what the cost of doing that was. So eventually the U-turn was a way to, in a sense, cancel the basic dimensions of that referendum. Immediately after that, Syriza got rid of its more radical elements who had been against the U-turn. New elections were called. A new uh, memorandum was voted by the majority of the Greek parliament. It was the first time after 2010, after the first bailout, in which the immense majority of the Greek parliament was voting in support of a bailout. So here is another contradiction. The more painful the austerity becomes, the bigger its support in the parliament, right? Um, and it also undermines everything that we know about retrospective voting. So presumably Syriza was voted in order to produce a better deal. They failed to do that, and they got voted back with the exact same proportion of votes. Uh, question, is it a new Syriza? Certainly it doesn't have its radical wing. It, it has been forced to implement the very measures that it described in the past as quasi-genocidal for the country. Uh, and that has failed to um, uh, improve the situation of the economy. So where are we now? Um, that could be almost another lecture. But the bottom line is that, in a sense, uh, those measures are very painful. And that party has a very difficult time passing those measures. And right now, there is a potential deadlock looming again, because for Greece to, in a sense, become part of the quantitative easing program of the European Central Bank, which is going to mean the European Central Bank can buy Greek bonds and therefore uh, inject liquidity in the Greek economy, Greece has to pass the reviews, meaning that it has implemented the reforms it has agreed on. And those reforms include two very difficult and very contentious issues. One is the pension reform, because the Greek pension system is unsustainable for a variety of reasons, including uh, the distribution of uh, age population in Greece, which is very much skewed to older populations. But also the taxation of farmers, who up to now were not taxed in Greece, pretty much. That is my final graph, and it gives you uh, uh, two lines. The green line is the uh, economic sentiment as measured by various surveys. And the blue line is the so-called PMI index, which is what the managers of firms who are in charge of ordering goods um, um, are believing about the state of the economy. So it's a very good predictor of, again, beliefs. And as you can see, those lines go in parallel, and they both collapsed. Both economic sentiment and PMI collapsed in June. So the shock of the referendum to the economy was, was very big in terms of expectations. Oops. So to conclude, two slides. Greece is facing, I would argue, three possible paths, three possibilities. The first, uh, what a lot of people thought may have been the case after the compromise and the U-turn, what we may describe as the Lula scenario. Lula was the leader of Brazil, someone who got elected on a left-wing platform, but eventually managed to create a sort of mix of policies, uh, giving uh, free reign to capitalist enterprises to invest, but at the same time taxing them more in order to create prog programs against poverty and being quite successful. So the idea here is that the best people to implement right-wing measures are left-wingers, because they have you know, uh, the unions on their side, etc. And perhaps some people thought that way among that party. That is, the idea was, let's implement all the difficult measures, and then the situation is going to improve. Four years down the road, things are going to look better, and we are going to, uh, to grasp uh, and gain what uh, we invested. However, in order to do that, you really have to own those reforms. You cannot be of two hearts. And it seems that this government doesn't really believe in those reforms. 
which is not surprising given that things have not been really working very well for the last six years. But on top of it, it lacks the kind of skill that is necessary for implementing a lot of these measures. You need highly skilled people. And one of the things that, was hap that is happening in Greece is a lot of the appointments uh, in the Greek, in various Greek agencies in charge of implementing those reforms are appointments of party hacks with very, very limited uh, background, especially you know, given the fact that this is a party that was very small and very marginal. Uh, so we have a, both a skills and beliefs issue, and it's very unlikely that this is going to be, I think, even though we cannot exclude it, but I think at this juncture it doesn't look very likely. The second is uh, a sort of what we may describe as post-communist scenario, perhaps, with some exaggeration, but it's the stagnation of Greece within the Eurozone. So Greece doesn't exit, but doesn't do better. It's a situation in which it's basically uh, a ward of Europe uh, without very big prospects. And the last is, you know, things reach a, a point of no return. Some sort of accident or explosion take place and Greece has to leave the Euro. On top of it, to make things even more complicated, we have the refugee crisis of which Greece is at the forefront again. And I've written a book about Greece in which I think I explain the whole of Greek history as, as an example of how a small country uh, whose population and size uh, are completely insignificant, managing to cause uh, and to be at the forefront of very interesting global phenomena. So that's another kind of uh, instance of that. So the refugee crisis, it's unclear what is going to be its effect, how it's going to play out. But right now, there is a very big discussion going on about excluding Greece from the Schengen Zone Agreement, which means the zone of free circulation of citizens within Europe, uh, because most of the refugee flows from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and other countries uh, are channeled through Turkey, the Aegean, the Greek islands, and Greece itself. Uh, it's not clear how this problem is going to be resolved. Uh, it brings a different type of Brexit. Uh, it is a fundamental problem for Europe it, uh, itself, and it's, it's a, a topic, completely different topic from another set of lectures. Finally, what do we learn from all that story about the European integration process? As I said, uh, people have said and have discussed these issues as in terms of the a dilemma. Uh, on Europe uh, can either federalize itself more or disintegrate. Uh, and it's very difficult to figure out what the direction is going to be precisely because, um, in a sense, the European system was designed to move only through crisis. Why? Because it's an experiment that asks from sovereign states to sacrifice their sovereignty, which is something that sovereigns, by definition, wouldn't do. So the only way to sacrifice your fiscal sovereignty, your ability to draw your budget, for example, is to face a crisis with very, you know, much worse options. I think right now Greece is an example of that situation of a country that has been suffering through this kind of membership but finds the cost of living much higher than the cost of remaining. Um, and so the interest of, of that crisis is that it captures a lot of these contradictions but at the same time also I think highlights what the ways out of those contradictions would be which also imply that if the cr you know, crisis is the way for more integration, is that Europe is going to produce crisis after crisis. That the idea that, in a sense, moving towards integration would be a painless and crisis-less path, I think, does not hold. I cannot imagine such an outcome. It also raises very interesting questions about legitimacy. Uh, when you are no longer uh, in a position of um, deciding what your budget is, uh, who are, is it to blame? When you vote in national elections or you call referenda on the national level uh, about defaulting on your partners, for example, then in a sense you imply that your partners could also be calling referenda about that. And the same question about the refugees. How do you solve problems of sovereignty and of legitimacy? A very well-known economist, Danny Roderick, has argued that you cannot have um, everything at the same time. You cannot have globalization, democracy, and um, uh, a process of pooling together economic resources. He calls it the, uh, the trilemma. Uh, but in a sense, it's impossible to have a process uh, 
uh, of integration, which means by definition minimizing the sovereignty of the member states uh, without causing uh, a crisis of legitimacy, because legitimacy is located still in nation states. And this is what we see today in Europe with the rise of various populist parties, with the rise of governments that have been challenging some of the basic premises of Europe, mostly Hungary, but lately also Poland. And so it also raises a very interesting conceptual and theoretical question, which I just mentioned, which is crisis, in a sense, is, ob is observationally equivalent. It both signals integration it and disintegr disintegration. And there is no easy way to see how things are going in both directions. People very often, when they describe uh, the European project, especially from that side of the Atlantic, tend to uh, emphasize very much the absence of vision or the elite dimension of the European project and how disconnected it is from the aspirations of everyday citizens. That is true to some extent, even though it is not completely true, because if you actually look at um, public opinion surveys, uh, there is much more support for Europe than there appears to be when you actually talk to people and when uh, you hear what people have to say about Brussels and the faceless Eurocrats who run the show. Um, at the same time, however, there is another aspect which is very interesting, which is the aspect of the costs. The costs are enormous of living. And so even though it's not very sexy to say that you can have a, an integration proj project which is based on the threat of very high costs, I think that's, in a sense, the only hope for Europe. It's not going to be a lofty vision. I think it's much more likely to be uh, the sense of cost. And of course, that's, that, that means that accidents can happen uh, at every uh, juncture. But I don't think that, it's, that this is necessarily bad. And what is very interesting, again, about the Greek case is that in spite of everything that has happened, about 70% of, of, of Greek public opinion still support membership in the Eurozone, in spite of all that, which I think tells you something along those lines. So I'm going to stop here. I hope I've opened a lot of uh, interesting questions. There's much more to say. And thank you very much for coming uh, this afternoon. So shall I take questions? Yeah. Yes, in the back. Think this makes sense, but how much of this issue is changing an economic system or changing a culture? But just because you change the currency, that's not that's a small impact on the culture. What I have a hard time understanding is I mean I'm not a economist. So you have some very interesting aspects here. So let me try to answer those. In terms of why would the banks loan uh, uh, Greece, they loaned it precisely because they bought the narrative that Greece would never exit the euro. And they were right. Up to this very specific moment, they were right. Greece did not exit the euro. It was bailed out. right? So the banks were correct in lending because they bought that narrative. We'll see whether they're going to be proven <coughs> correct in the longer term, but, uh, but up to now I would say they, uh, they basically put their money where their faith was. The idea that those countries were connected in a way that was so complicated and so costly to disconnect that those loans were going to be honored. Number two, uh, the difference in culture. Well, when I hear this question, I very often think, you know, how different is the culture between, say, Montana, New York, and Arizona? I would probably say there's a very deep gap. And in fact, you know, New York State or the Northeast has been, in a sense, subsidizing the Western states to a very, very generous tune, right? Now, of course, nobody stops and thinks today in the United States, well, should we stop funding those damn Montana people, right? <laughs> They just do it. Uh, but eventually, this is what is happening in Europe up to the moment. People complain. 
But as I argued, the Eurozone states and the EFSF have basically um, owned Greece and own its debt. And this debt uh, is not going to be repaid in full. And so no matter uh, how unhappy various publics were, at the end of the day, the money was paid. Uh, and that creates much stronger links and connections. So cultures are never going to be homogenized. But on the other hand, institutions um, are going to be much more connected if the process doesn't derail for any reason or another, are going to be much more connected. And they are more connected today than they were six years ago. So again, there are two sides to that picture. Yes. Well, because nobody was paying attention, and Eurostat was a completely, uh, and, and the Greek National Statistical Agency had, was completely corrupt. Uh, but I, I would have thought that, did, wasn't that, wouldn't that would be independent diligence on the part of Eurostat? It was supposed to happen. One of the features that makes the European project so interesting is that, uh, to some degree, it, in, it continues to be what we call an intergovernmental uh, project that is you have an association of sovereign governments. And very often they do, they close their eyes when they need to. And there is quite a lot of that. And there is a culture of consensus in Europe that means that very often things that are not supposed to happen are allowed to happen. Of course, the Greek case was an extreme situation of that. But that's exactly why there was such a demand for bringing the IMF in, to have what was perceived as a, a, an arbiter who would be uh, completely disconnected from that policy process, <laughs> implement that agreement. A second question. Uh, I don't understand the Greek uh, voting system. It's, it, it's not like the British, is it? Or is no, it's a PR with a 3% right. threshold, right. uh, which means that it, it's much more representative than uh, the American or the British system. It allows small it's parties. Not necessarily. Uh, it was uh, it had this two-party dominance because those two parties really uh, were had mobilized a lot of resources and were able to use public resources as part of this clientelist scheme that they described before. So they were able, in a sense, to create a sort of cartel over the system that was not due mm -hmm. to the type uh, of electoral system, but to their ability to use those resources. They're also based uh, on very long-standing identities. You can trace back voting behavior um, to, to the beginning of the 20th century and to the split between monarchists uh, and republicans. So there, there is a long tradition that uh, the two side party uh, represents. Uh, yes? So one of the things that's hardest to follow from outside Greece is Greek public administration, which is also one of the hardest yeah. things to affect. So you kind of alluded to efforts to improve the functioning of the tax system, the health system. How's it going? And is there any content to Syriza's claim that they were going to reform the corrupt clientelistic system? Well, the first thing is that it's very difficult to reform a system under conditions of extreme crisis. And Tocqueville has a famous argument that this is how you create revolutions, by trying to reform when you shouldn't. <laughs> Generally speaking, you're better off changing things when the economy is good. You shouldn't be doing a lot of inducing pain and uh, uh, trying to reform when you induce pain. But uh, um, a lot. Uh, of this bailout package that included uh, very um, uh, extensive reforms was, uh, in a sense, um, designed uh, in the last moment uh, under the threat of default and collapse of the Greek economy, which means that it was very poorly designed. So for example, there was a pro program of generate reducing the size of the, of the Greek public administration in order to save money and also to rationalize it. <coughs> uh, but as a result of the way it was designed, it meant uh, that it was much easier to reduce its size by through attrition than through layoffs. That meant two things. It meant that a very large number of public uh, employees left and got very good pensions. So in fact, they imposed a much higher financial cost to the Greek state. The second thing is a lot of these people who left had, were the people who had the most experience. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, the public administration became even weaker. So you have a lot of unanticipated effects that are the result of both poor design and also a sort of collusion between international actors who are 
you know, responding to incentives that are very short term and Greek politicians who responded to their own incentives. And as a result of that, you got a lot of these kinds of distortions uh, and poor design that produced additional costs and basically come back to, uh, to haunt the country very quickly. Yes. It is a very big problem, but it's not due to cultural characteristics. It turns out that the best predictor of tax non-compliance in every economy, including the US, uh, is the presence of small businesses and small operators that operate with cash. Uh, but you know, the reason why Greece has had this problem, which is true, is because it has a very large sector of uh, professionals, individual professionals, and small businesses. Very few large firms. Yes, I know a lot was said, like yeah. the guy who sold So it's extremely difficult uh, to, uh, in a sense, police this type of economy. And as a result, even though I don't know what the numbers are, even though there has been some uh, contraction of tax avoidance, at every step of economic difficulty, it, becomes, it comes back uh, with a vengeance. And you, again, you get very interesting unanticipated effect distortions. For example, one of the easy solutions that was found to increase revenue was to increase the tax on alcohol uh, and cigarettes. And now Greece has become a place where alcohol and cigarettes are produced outside <laughs> the legal system and you have a lot of, uh, and, and as a result it has produced a decrease. That is, you would have gotten more taxes if you didn't increase those taxes in the first place. It's, it's a sort of social science laboratory in which you can see <laughs> every unanticipated effect and you know how these things coalesce together in ways that you should have known but you know, people didn't have the incentives or the time or the ability to just take all these things into account. Yes. I've read in um, several of your interviews that you insist on. Uh, That's a personal question. <laughs> well, it relates to your. your yes. You insist on the um, objectivity of the social scientist um, as opposed to, let's say, the ideological language of the non expert or even. Okay, so in terms of objectivity, there is a misunderstanding about what that means. Certainly, I would argue social science is not the sort of end and cure for everything. And there are many uh, open issues. And I, I think I illustrated a number of ways in which uh, economists, with even with access to the best data, could disagree among themselves. But the level of disagreement is going to be very different than the level of disagreement about, about you know, from non-experts. So I would say expertise matters, not in that it provides the perfect uh, 
uh, medicine the perfect analysis or the perfect recipe, but it provides a much better one uh, than any of the non-experts. So it makes a difference. And this is where I come in. This is not the result of original research in the sense that I, you know, my field of investigation has been in a number of other areas, but at the same time I'm a social scientist and I've studied Greece extensively and I wrote a book about that. So I bring to the table, I think, an understanding and an insight that you wouldn't find from a non-expert. Having said that, there are other experts who would know as much as I know who would provide alternatives. But the level of disagreement and the type of disagreement would be very different than the type of disagreement either between an expert and a non-expert or between non-experts. So there is a quantitative difference. I would argue that I um, am very much in line with the perception that social science does not provide us with the perfect answers that the hard sciences provides us, but at the same time that they bring something additional to the table, for example, better data. So for example, when I say that Greece was better off, uh, than after having joined the Europe, I meant in terms of GDP. Now, of course, you could say, what about unemployment? Uh, we don't know what the counterfactual would have been. We don't have a way. Certainly, there was lower unemployment before Greece joined uh, the Eurozone, but certainly there was much more inflation. So we could compare on inflation, or we could compare on the level, for example, to which you know, the level of, you know, uh, uh, of non-regulated labor. Uh, so there are a number of different dimensions. The reason why I emphasize the GDP is because people assume that even at the level of GDP, um, Greece has lost so much that it is at the level of misery equivalent to that of uh, the Great Depression in the United States, which is not true. So that was, um, you know, the corrective to that. And I think, you know, human development indexes or even an index such as, you know, what country is it good to be born to, I think provide you with a good set of uh, uh, perspectives and insights. Um, did I leave an aspect um, unanswered? Because I may have forgotten. So to summarize, I would say, you know, these are very complex. Ah, you, you answered up the question about the three alternatives. There is uh, the, the stagnation, or didn't mention you know, the, the kind of scenario under which you reach the stagnation. You may reach it either because you implement those reforms, but they don't work. You may reach it because you try to implement, it, implement them, but you don't. Or you may reach it because you make the minimal effort. So there are different paths to stagnate. Uh, the first scenario was the positive scenario, the scenario in which um, the party owns the reforms and those reforms work. That could be the good scenario. Or another party applies those reforms, and those reforms actually produce some outcome and generate a positive rebound. Uh, and uh, you can find many cases in which countries have implemented very painful uh, conditionality policies and have come out quite successful. But again, the problem with the social sciences is every country has a unique set of characteristics, so you need to compare and abstract in the most appropriate way. I also think it's very interesting to look in the historical past of Greece. I think the period under, again, with very big differences, is very similar to a similar type of period at the end of the 19th century when Greece defaulted in 1893. Uh, there was a very uh, highly uh, severe and highly conditional regime of outside international economic control that was imposed that lasted until 1910. And I think it was very successful. Uh, in the case of Greece, it was very painful. This is the period in which you have about seven to 800,000 people emigrating to the United States, right? So it was a very, very difficult period. But again, we have all kinds of examples. It's a matter of actually balancing. So it's much more of trying to find the, the right combination of factors and variables to sort of try to make an assessment. But even with that, I would argue it's very difficult today to predict what you know, uh, any of those outcomes is going to be. In terms of the final point, um, what the alternative would be in terms of an exit from the euro? Uh, there are a number of studies from various uh, organizations and from economists. Greece has an economy which is very much uh, import dependent. Uh, it Im imports energy, it imports food, uh, it imports um, a variety of other goods which means that initially at least the humanitarian cost of finding yourself without the ability to import is going to be tremendous. So, and everyone agrees on that. I think no one disagrees. Where the disagreement happens is people arguing that after this initial period of extreme and acute crisis, 
then you may have an enormous devaluation that would allow the economy to recover by becoming more competitive versus those who say, you know, the damage would be so much and the features of the Greek economy are such that even that scenario uh, is not possible. I tend to buy the second argument. And the reason I tend to buy the second argument is because Greece had had three major devaluations in the 1980s and 90s, all of which failed to cause an improvement in the competitiveness of the economy, which tells me that, and tells the economists who do those studies, that there is a fundamental problem of competitiveness, which is the problem of external balance, which needs to be addressed. And you are not going to be to address it just by lowering salaries through devaluation. In fact, one of the things that's very interesting is that one of the most failed reforms has been labor reforms that have lowered salaries without producing added uh, experts. In fact, uh, the uh, balance, the balancing of the external balance of Greece has been the result of minimizing imports, but not increasing exports. That tells me and tells the economists that in order to really make the Greek economy more competitive, you need much more radical reforms than reducing salaries and therefore devaluing. So devaluation wouldn't work. So that would be, I think, a very powerful argument against exiting and devaluing. Um, but generally speaking, I think a common currency forces you to become a country that fits uh, the image and the content and the reputation of that currency. So it, to go back to your question, it forces Greece to become more like Germany. And here there are two arguments. There are arguments who say there is no way Greece can ever become right. Uh, Exactly. So that would be a culturalist argument. And then there would be an argument which is much more institutionalist, that if you force a country to uh, adopt certain institutions that have certain benefits and certain costs, eventually the institutions can be proven much more powerful. Now, there's a very big debate in political science about that. I tend to be more of an institutionalist than a culturalist, but I cannot prove that this point is true all across every case, and it remains to be seen. Again, even if Greece were to default to exits, people would argue that the outcomes, whatever the outcome would have been, they would still find arguments uh, to argue those points. So even if Greece completely failed under the new regime, people would argue, well, but it didn't use certain measures in certain ways and therefore could have succeeded and vice versa. So there is no end in these kinds of debates. Yes. Again, I'm not an expert, even less of an expert uh, on those issues, so I, I feel uh, a bit getting outside my area. Uh, one of the puzzles is why, uh, uh, first of all, what explains variation in refugee flows? And I don't think we have a good understanding of that. It's certainly not just the situation in Syria, because the situation has been constantly very bad for a long time. So it's not clear to me that is the type of fighting or the way the war uh, is continuing. So there must be additional factors. The second thing is, uh, it's not clear why the Greek road, because there have been a variety of other roads. Given the fact, you know, the unknown factors that have led to an increase in the flows, and given a number of factors that have led those refugees to follow the Greek road, then that generates additional effects. For example, one of the things that people have noticed is a lot of people from Morocco who are potentially economic migrants buy a cheap ticket, travel to Istanbul, and then cross from Greece. So you get additional. Uh, and then you get, again, these feedback loops. When Germany announced that it would uh, welcome asylum seekers, it generated an additional wave. Uh, and once you generate those waves, you have long-term effects. For example, you create people with the skill and the incentive in Turkey to become entrepreneurs in passing refugees. And once you create those people, it's, it's becoming much more difficult to get rid of them. And those people <coughs> then have an incentive to perpetuate their business. So you get a lot of additional issues that are not, n not easy to tackle. Um, so I don't know uh, how this situation is going to evolve and, and where it's going to go and what its potential uh, ramifications and implications are. I just don't. Ah. Okay. I'm sorry about, uh, well, thank you very much for your questions.